and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin.
<laughs> Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies. And grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. For the festival of the Reformation is from the book of Revelation to St. John, the 14th chapter. St. John writes, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join in our reading from the small catechism with the second commandment and its meaning. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon him in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. The epistle reading is from St. Paul's letter to the church in Rome, the third chapter. St. Paul writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. <coughs> then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise to the Holy Gospel. sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. 
For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
The events that are playing out in the Ukraine and in Israel, in Gaza, are good reminders that the kingdoms of the earth are overcome by violence. Glory is won by force. The strong and the powerful are rewarded. The leaders of the earth rule with armies and weapons. And at the first sign of weakness, others rise up to take their place. But not the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. It's a kingdom not made up of the strong, but of the weak children, of the lowly, of martyrs, of those that the world has cast aside. And those who lay hold of it are those who suffer violence with and for it. They lay hold of it by a violent separation from the world of violence. For they fix their eyes on Jesus and put their hands to the plow and don't look back. When struck, they turn the other cheek. They are weak. And instead of being obsessed with the things of this world, they find themselves obsessed with their king and his kingdom that is not of this world. It's the picture of faith. That the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent taken by force. The church doesn't operate according to the principles of the world. It's not reasonable. It doesn't make sense. Its ruler didn't order up a huge army to storm the walls of Jerusalem. Instead, when he rode in on the back of a donkey and her colt, he was greeted by children and prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. And by the end of the week, those who stood by his throne was only one of the twelve who had followed him for three years. His mother, a few of the women, and some others who had been too fearful to admit to belonging to this king. And what kind of God allows men to commit violence against him anyways, let alone kill him? Not the leaders that we see on TV today, or read about on the internet. The ones we see flying around the world, drumming up financing for their wars. Those who find themselves hiding deep in bunkers under the earth. Maybe that's why we are so taken by movies and books that have kings and leaders who are standing right there on the front lines willing to risk their very own life. Because we know most of them won't. Our King, our God, is love, and He loves mankind. And it propels Him to interact with a sinful world that rejected His love in the first place. Out of love, for a while, He denies Himself the glories of sitting on his heavenly throne, to be born in a stable, to have no place of his own. 
and to rely on the generosity of those who followed after him to make sure that he had something to eat, and something to drink, and a place to lay his head. He suffers violence, and by that violence the kingdom of God was won. And by your baptism, you have died and risen with Christ. You have been drawn into Him. So therefore, the King has taken up residence in your heart. You are His kingdom of grace. This day, of course, wouldn't be complete without at least one mention of what sparked the Reformation. It was indulgences that were sold to raise money for a building project, of all things. The building of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Little pieces of paper thought to forgive years off an imagined purgatory that were for sale. All because of a building project. It was man's wisdom that twisted God's word around and entrapped many in its wicked net one way or another. Yet God raised up a champion who forever changed the world that followed and still continues to change it today. And by the power of God, he spoke the Lord's testimony before kings. He obeyed God rather than men and suffered violence for it. He would not allow the church to burden the consciences of those who rightly suffered and were convicted by the law. Nor would he allow the church to give comfort to those who were secure in their sins just because they were wealthy or were smartly connected. We must ask, where are his sons and daughters? Where are those believers of a heroic, violent faith who aren't afraid to stand up for the truth, who will not bend when the world demands it, who are willing to speak the word of God even in the face of a world that refuses to hear. The wisdom of man has always resisted the word of God. It seeks to make the salty less salty. Easier to swallow for a generation of people who refuse to even acknowledge the most basic of truths anymore. And in another way, it seeks to draw narrow, even the already narrow way of grace for fear of allowing the wrong kind of people into heaven. And so with false promises and the ever-growing desire to itch the ears of the culture today, the kingdom of God is violated. Repent. I'm not talking about leaders in our synodical districts or some of the warehouse churches down the street that dot our communities. I'm talking about you. We've tried to solve what we imagine were the church's problems with our own solutions. So we've taken the word of God and we've judged it by the standards of the world and we found it lacking. So when the events of this past week in Maine occurred, instead of calling evil, evil, and speaking the truth of God's word, we've hemmed and hawed because 
We don't want to make God out to be someone that the world might reject. We've done it with our family and friends. We know the Ten Commandments well, but we've judged them to be too burdensome. And so as we talked about in Bible class last week, we've continued to try to lower the bar and lower the bar. And no matter how much we've tried to lower the bar for those, we always seem to trip over it. Failing even then to keep the simplest of God's commands. But then, as I mentioned before, is the other side of it. That God's grace is too grace-filled. Because we're a little too afraid of who we might see in heaven and who may join us at the temple of God and the resurrection of the dead. What if we mistakenly tell someone that they are forgiven? It is what we do. And at times we treat God's word as if it's never enough. But Jesus didn't need Peter's help in the garden. And he doesn't need us to twist his word around to make it more acceptable to this world. Preach the word. In season and out of season. God's Word will do what it does best. And that is gather sinners around Jesus. It's kind of stressful being a member of a church. There's never enough money. There are never enough people in the pews. There's never enough time to get everything done. Always thinking that if I don't do just a little bit more, if I don't participate in one more thing, the church will fail. But relax. The Holy Spirit is at work. He is at work with the same words of the prophets and the apostles gave us thousands of years ago. And by those words, Christ is still here. And the church is still here. The Spirit doesn't need us to make it more palatable. He just desires that the word would be spoken. As we sang in our intro for today from Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord, and let the humble <coughs> hear and be glad. And by simply keeping the word of God in our hearts and on our lips, God will and can change hearts and minds that were once cemented into sin. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Come and eat without money, without price. Come regardless of your class or your wealth, your ethnicity or your political leaning. Come, good or bad, greatest or the least. Come. John invited Herod. It didn't stop John from speaking the word of God. And neither did it stop Jesus suffered so that he might love you and make you his own. 
For you, he suffered violence on the cross. And by it, you are saved. It's a hard pill for a pastor to swallow, and it's one that can be hard for us too as Christians, but it's something that we have to remember. The word of the Lord will never be good enough for the world. The demands that the law makes are too demanding, and the invitation that the gospel offers is too free. But look, you're here. The church still exists. Not by our parents or our grandparents, or Martin Luther, or by St. Peter, or even Noah himself but only by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. So rejoice. Rejoice and receive. God has done it all, and he will continue to do it. There is nothing left for us to do but to boast in the name of the Lord. To cry out with the crowds of Palm Sunday and with the saints and the angels who are in heaven, whom we will remember next week, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The payment's been made. Nothing can separate you from his love. He's put his name on your forehead. You hear his word. You drink his blood. You eat his body. You are his. And he is yours. So where are those who trust God's word? Where are those who aren't afraid to believe the foolishness of the gospel? Who are those unwilling to twist the word of God around just to make it a little bit more relevant, just to get one more member in the door, to pay one more bill? Look to your love. Seriously, look to your left. I know those of you over there, there's a wall. Look to your right. You're sitting next to them. And you might see them according to their weaknesses. You might see them according to the sins that they've committed against you. And that you still struggle with letting go. You might see them because of their age, one way or another. But when God sees, he sees in you his own son, his own faith. So let the violence come. God is on your side. You will not fail. The battle is won. God be praised. Believe it. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, all understanding, guard your heart and mind in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Now I invite you to please rise and join me in singing the words of the author.
for the church, that God would deliver her from error, and preserve her, and the, preserve in her the proclamation of the gospel, and that all would fear the Lord and give Him glory. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for all who are blind to the bondage of their sin, that God would open their eyes by the words of Jesus and grant them the true freedom of sonship through a permanent place in his household. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for our homes and families, that God would keep us in his word and make us truly his disciples freed from errors and at peace, and especially for all fathers, that God would preserve and encourage them for their godly task to bring up children who would fear him. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy for the civil authorities, especially our president, Congress, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws that God would protect them from the temptations that beset their offices and grant them wisdom and courage to serve with integrity and truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for all who cry to God for healing of body and soul, especially Eric, Deb, Kathy, for Gail's sister and her son, for Norma, Declan, Vera, Dan, Mike, Vicki, Gary, Vic, Fred, Larry, Jennifer, Paula, Jonathan, Jessica, and Peggy, that he would grant them release from their afflictions according to his will and sustain their hope until the day of Christ's appearing. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for all who come to Christ's altar seeking the forgiveness of sins, that with repentant hearts they may receive his gifts, seek to amend their lives, and by his Spirit be aligned with his will and purpose. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Mighty fortress, rock of refuge, we give you thanks for all your servants who have departed this life in faith. We especially bless you today for the great reformers of your church who call us back to the gospel and to the righteousness we have in Christ alone. Keep us in fellowship with them and bring us at last to our heavenly home and the joy of seeing our Redeemer face to face. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
blood of Christ shed for you. Depart now in peace and joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.
Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. Thank you. 
We rise for the Nukta Mithras. <laughs>
uh, Blessed Reformation Day observed, because Reformation Day officially falls on the 31st of October. I'm told that there are all, there's another holiday that day, but Blessed Reformation Day, maybe that's what you should tell all the kids when they come to your door on Tuesday <laughs> night, and I'll be like, what? And then you can share the gospel with them. Huh. Anyways. Um, a Blessed Reformation Day, and of course an early all, Blessed All Saints Day as well, as uh, of course the 1st of November is officially All Saints Day on the church calendar, um, but we always observe it on that first Sunday of November as well. Um, so next week, of course, we'll switch our frontal over to white, and we'll be singing several Easter hymns as well as All Saints hymns to give thanks to God for the gift of the saints who reside in heaven with him, looking forward to the day of the resurrection, and of course, the saints who still surround us here on earth as well. So please come and join us for that as well. Um, there is all sorts of... Yes, sweetheart? Um, was I supposed to get names of the saints? I was going to mention that, but I was going to hold off on that until the end. So, thanks for jumping the gun. <laughs> At least you're reminded. Um, there's all sorts of stuff going on in the next couple of weeks. There's so much going on that I'm not going to mention everything for fear that I will miss something and offend someone. So, I know. <laughs> so I highly suggest taking your bulletin home with you this week to keep track of all of the stuff that is going on here at Good Shepherd over the next couple of weeks. We've got dinners, one that's going to happen here in just about an hour. Um, please come and join us for our Harvest Reformation meal. Um, we're also going to be playing some games as well, so, you know, limber up those fingers. Um, Joe, get that hand ready to, to, to slap the Uno game thing. Um, be careful if you play with Joe. She might try to slide cards underneath the table. I don't know. It makes me wonder sometimes. But anyways, come and join us for that. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff. Like I said, there are a few other things scheduled. Um, especially for next week, don't forget. Um, daylight savings time starts next Sunday. So don't forget to roll back your clocks next week. Um, and as I already mentioned, we do have All Saints Day. And has been our tradition here at Good Shepherd. We do remember first um, those saints in our own congregation who have been called by the Lord to rest in Him until the day of the resurrection. Um, but if you also have family or friends who have also died in the Christian faith, um, if you would like us to remember as well, please leave their name. Um, and your name as well, so that we know, especially if we can't read your handwriting. Then Sarah knows who to call and say, how do you write this? And more importantly, how does pastor say it? <laughs> um, let me tell you that that is sometimes embarrassing as well when you get a name that you're supposed to say and you have no idea how to say it. And it gets completely butchered. So... Um, if you do have any friends or family who have died in the Christian faith over this past year, from last November 1st to this, um, you can either call Sarah during the week, but I would request that you get those in by Thursday, if at all possible, um, because Friday morning is when we are trying to get the bulletin printed off. So if you could have those in by Thursday afternoon, that would be perfect as well. Um, as I said before, there's all sorts of other information and things going on in the church, so I'm going to let you read that in the bulletin. Um, so, with that, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.